What's going on everyone? My name is Aaron Mole and I am the director of the Dolly Madison Murders documentary, which is streaming now. I'm finally able to say it. I'm excited to say it that the documentary that I've been working on for the better part of a year is finally out and available to watch. So if you haven't already seen that, um, please watch that before coming to this video. I'm gonna list down below all the ways in which you can currently watch it. That list will change over time. I'll do my best to update um, as that list uh, changes. Um, but the best place to watch it right now uh, for everyone is Tubi. Tubi is a free to watch app that comes pre-installed on a lot of smart TVs nowadays. I know my TV has like a little Tubi button next to the Netflix and Hulu button. If you have a smart TV but don't have Tubi, you can download the Tubi app. You can also use your phone, computer, tablet to get the Tubi app for free and watch it there. Uh, but like I said, down below, I'm gonna be changing the list as it changes on where you can watch it. If Tubi isn't available where you are, I'm sure there's somewhere that you can check it out. So this video, what you're watching right now, is kind of gonna act as a mega video that is like a side piece to the documentary. I'm gonna go in depth on certain things that for one reason or another, we didn't include in the documentary or couldn't. Um, there are certain things that we talked about in the documentary that maybe we just barely touched on that we're gonna dive deeper into because more stuff has come out since filming the documentary. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the actual process of making a documentary. For those of you who don't know, I shot, edited, produced. Uh, I did this entire thing by myself, which, you know, it, it's the way I chose to do it, but I kind of want to talk about that process because people have asked me to, you know, to explain certain things on how, how I went about it. And so that's what this video is going to be. But more than anything, I'm excited just to talk about this case more in depth. I think this is going to be an exciting thing to have alongside the documentary because this is a little bit less pressure in making something that's polished. This is going to be very thrown together, but like I said, we're gonna just kind of lay stuff out there. I'm gonna go into depth on some of the pushback that I maybe didn't include in the documentary on from the law enforcement side and some of the, just the weird things that occurred throughout this process. I think, like I said, it says a lot about where they are with this case. I think it's it's good to be transparent about how, how everything went down. So. Like I said, go see the documentary because you'll learn about the case in the best way possible. But I am going to kind of recap and do an introduction to this case for those of you who maybe don't know or haven't seen the doc. I'm gonna just kind of explain uh, so we can get into some of the other things. Uh, this took place in my hometown. I talk about that in the doc. People have asked me, why did you choose this story? Some of the people that follow me here on YouTube and they don't know that I actually grew up in Great Bend, Kansas. So this story quite literally hits close to home because I grew up in a house until I was like three or four that was right behind the Dolly Madison Bakery. So I didn't live in that house when it happened, but I lived just down the road. So it, it's a story that I've always known. Seeing that composite sketch all over town, I think if you're from Great Bend and you're watching this, you'll agree that this case took up a little bit of space in everybody's head for years, right? You would always see the composite sketch around town. You'd hear about it, you know, five years past, 10 years past, 15 years past, and people still would talk about it, you know, around the anniversary. So yeah, I guess I'm getting into why I made it before I go into the, uh, the, the overview of the murders. This is what I'm talking about with the loose format of just almost like this being a podcast. But essentially, that's what happened. So years passed. I grew up in Great Bend. I don't live there anymore. I haven't lived in Great Bend for quite some time. But it's a story that I've always had in my head as one that was tragic and unfortunate. And I always wondered why, not, not necessarily why it never was solved, but just like why has no one ever really taken this story and tried to shed a bigger light on it. So year after year, people would talk about it, but that would be it. You know, they'd do something maybe for the 10 year anniversary, the media would do something or the newspaper. But then in September of 2021, the 19th year anniversary came around. I saw a Facebook post saying, you know, I can't believe it's been 19 long years. And it just hit me at that point, like, wow, it is almost 20 years old. And this case is still unsolved. I saw that on my phone and I, I realized like, wait, I should do that. I should make a documentary. I made the decision then and there on the right around the time of the 19th year anniversary that I was going to, in the lead up to the 20th year anniversary, dedicate an entire year 
to this project, to making this documentary. And that's exactly what I did. So between September and January, so the start of 2022, for a couple of months, I was essentially kind of looking at the case with a fresh set of eyes, trying to see like, what is out there around the case? Is there a lot to even work with online? And there's not. It's from 2002. So the internet was obviously around, but it wasn't what it is today. And so obviously I came across a few articles, a few people that are connected to the case. And then I realized that I had some mutual friends, a mutual friend specifically, that was also a friend with one of the victims, or, or sorry, one of the victim's friends. And he was able to connect me with her. And that ended up being Kathy, who is the friend of Mandy. And I got to talk to her and I kind of gauged whether or not this would be a good idea. And I mean, she was all for it because she has lived and breathed this case for years and years and years. And so she seemed thrilled at the idea. She was able to connect me then with some of the family members like Desiree and Karen, the mother of Mandy. And then she ultimately got me connected with uh, some people on the Drake side, um, one of the other victims, Mary Drake. So I'm get a getting ahead of myself a little bit on, in terms of names and people. But that's kind of how this project came about. And the reason why I wanted to do it is really just to shed a bigger light than ever had been shed on this story in an effort to just get it out there. We've all seen things like Unsolved Mysteries. They rebooted that for Netflix. And I think cases like that are so interesting because sometimes they just need that new boost, that fresh set of eyes or that, you know, that big story to come out around it. And that was my goal from the beginning of this. And that is still my goal now is for the most, you know, most amount of people to see this as possible and to hear about this story. Um, but that's kind of the why, the why, you know, around this project. Why did I begin working on it? A little bit of a recap on the Dolly Madison murders for those who don't know. The Dolly Madison murders took place in Great Bend, Kansas on September 4th, 2002. A woman by the name of Mandy Alexander, who was 24 years old at the time, had begun working at this day-old bread store or a discount bread store only a few days prior. I think she was on her third day on the job is what I've been told. She'd only worked there a handful of days. That's what we know. Essentially, Somebody killed Mandy Alexander inside the bread store sometime between, I think, 5.30 and 8 or 6.30 and 8. There's different, it's listed differently depending on where you look. And there is a woman by the name of Mary Drake, who was 79 years old at the time. So we have two different people in two different phases of their life, right? Somebody that, all things considered, has their whole life ahead of her being only 24 and then mary drake who still has life ahead of her according to the people i've talked to mary drake was just she could have had so much life to live even though she was on the other side of her life in comparison to mandy both of these people seem to have so much life to live still and so much to offer and uh, it's just tragic. Mary Drake was the other victim. So it's two female victims that were killed with a sharp object. That is how it's listed in all of the reports, all the papers. No murder weapon was ever found. There was money taken from the register, but I believe they left some of the money behind as well. And it was a very small amount of cash. Once again, never was able to really confirm the amount. I've heard less than $100. I've heard like $112. There was some cash taken and they were found in a pool of blood in the back office area of the bakery. I would go to that bakery all the time as a kid. I would run over from my grandparents' house. They would give us a $5 bill and my grandma would have us get a, a loaf of bread. And with the change, we could, you know, the kids could get little Debbie snacks, like junk food, right? Stuff that wasn't great for you, but we would get it and then we'd run back and give her the bread and we'd get to eat our junk food. We'd go over there all the time. When I say this story hits close to home, it really does because A, I could have just been in there because I've got, I went in there so many times. My sister or my grandma, my grandma could have been Mary Drake. And I think that's why this scared so many people in Great Bend because I think everyone saw somebody in each of those victims, whether it was themselves in Mandy or a loved one in Mary Drake. Like, wow, this didn't happen on a dirt road north of town. This happened at one of the busiest intersections in town, arguably. And I think even today, 20 years later, it could still be considered one of the busiest. It depends on the time of day, obviously, but 10th Street runs east and west through the city of Great Bend, and there's a lot of through traffic from non-locals that just passes through on 10th Street. And then Harrison Street is a north-south street in town. 
there's just a lot of local traffic like the documentary states as well. And there's a McDonald's on the corner, a bank, an Applebee's, and then the Dolly Madison was there as well. There's a few small hotels nearby. I mean, residential areas sprinkled throughout. I mean, I think that there's a public school that's less than a mile even from there or two miles from there. So it's it's for Great Bend, it's busy. And the time of day that this happened as well is is something to consider because this person must have felt confident in what they were going to do because it would take a lot for somebody to go and feel like they could get away with something like this in general, let alone between 5.30 and 8 at one of the busiest intersections in town. There's train tracks that also run through there, and we talk about that in the dock. At any given time, there could be a train rolling through that intersection, and there could be 25, 30 cars on each section of the intersection backed up in either direction. For someone to do that in that intersection is already wild to me. But that's kind of the general overview of the case. Overall, there's a couple of moments that we're going to talk about that were big moments in the case, or at least seemingly big moments in the case. From the public's perspective of this case, to my knowledge, there was no real developments in this case. Publicly, people weren't aware of like, oh, I've heard that they, you know, they think it's this person or that person. I think the case itself really hit like a, just it plateaued. They really, they probably interviewed a fair amount of people, I would imagine. I, I don't know. They've said that they've interviewed an extensive amount of people. They've had legitimate suspects that they had in mind. To what extent that uh, that really is, I don't know. We're going to talk about things in this podcast that are absolutely going to question whether or not this case was handled correctly. And this is why I'm so excited about the podcast and this format, because I can just talk openly about this process. I talked to people throughout this documentary that that made me question this entire thing from a law enforcement perspective. We're gonna talk about some stuff that really is questionable in this, uh, but it needs to be talked about. That's kind of the gist of the case. Uh, it happened on an evening on one of the busiest intersections in town. Two people were brutally killed with a sharp object. That object was never found. Money was taken or allegedly was taken from the register. And to this day, 20 plus years later now, as we sit in 2023, no one has ever been arrested. I wanna just jump into some of the things that we weren't including in the documentary that we couldn't. And one of those things is talking about that night a little bit more because there's a lot of rumors around the night of the murders and how it was handled from a law enforcement perspective. Dean Akings, who was the police chief at the time, and Bruce Meller, who he held a pretty high position at the KBI in Great Bend at that time, were away the night of the murders at the Lodge of the Four Seasons in Missouri, which is six and a half hours from Great Bend, Kansas. They were there at an FBI national convention meeting or something along those lines for some sort of a, an event, right? A, a conference. When the call came in, Dean Akings, I was able to interview him. He told me that the call came in. They told him he needs to get back to town and they booked it back to Great Bend. Six and a half hours on a normal drive. Let's just say they got back in five hours, 45 minutes. They That's a long time for that crime scene to not have the top people there. I'll just say that for one. I mean, not to say that those those people couldn't handle what was in front of them, but that's, you know, two of the big wigs not present for the first five and a half probably hours, closer to six, depending on how fast they drove. So let's listen in a little bit more about uh, the night of the murders. When the initial call came out, it was not dispatched over the radio. The only thing that came out over the radio was to call in the dispatch. God. I called in, they said, you need to respond to Dolly Madison for a possible double homicide. I was like a mile and a half away, jumped in my car, drove there. I was the second officer that showed up there. Even though I was the second one, I was just a patrolman. And as soon as I got there, I was told, secure this area, don't let anyone near. Mm -hmm. And the sergeant on duty went inside, and I had never went in at all. Would the on-duty sergeant, would that have been Gunder by chance? Yep, Robert okay. Gunder. Gunder had beat me there. Like, he pulled in the parking lot, and I watched him pull in. And I pulled in, he said, I'm going to go and see what we got. Stay here. Don't let anyone come up. And... That was pretty much my orders for the rest of the night. I think Robert Williams was uh, also working that night. 
Uh, Terry Millard. One of the biggest things that I was told is that there were too many people in the bakery, too many members of law enforcement that were in there. I've heard rumors that they were inviting people in there that they shouldn't have been in there to see the dead bodies. I've heard that there are people with photos of the dead bodies that should not have photos of the dead bodies. I've heard that the sheriff at the time had a ride along with him, and this is all just rumors. I'm not saying that this is true. I've heard this, people have told me this. I don't know what to make of it. But I've heard that the sheriff at the time had somebody riding along with him, and they went in, and they blew chunks everywhere. They threw up. I don't know if that's true, but I've heard that. There's so many things that I've heard around this case that are wild and just, if true, just so unfortunate because it's like I've talked to other people that are experts in this, and it's like if you know that the bodies are dead, you seal the crime scene, and the only people that are there are people that need to be there. While Dean Akings and Bruce Miller were on their six-and-a-half-hour drive back, from Missouri, who was going through that crime scene? Was it people that weren't supposed to be there and they decided to come in because the, the head honchos weren't there? Were they breaking their own rules because they knew that they could get away with it? I've heard that there were far too many people in there. Um, but once again, I don't know what to make of that. Do you remember how many people could have possibly been in there? Had gone into the building? Right. Uh, between our detectives, which would have been at least four, younger would be five, and probably, I imagine Dean Akins went in several times, but he had at least three or four KBI agents. So, I mean, there, there was at least 10. So that officer saying that there could have been upwards of 10 people inside the crime scene, which I don't know if that's standard or not. You know, I have no idea how this goes, and I, I don't know how you know, what their protocol was back then, 20 plus years ago. Um, but th that is what he can remember. And another thing that stands out from that night was my conversation, my initial conversation I had with Reggie Kern, who was hired to clean up the crime scene after the bodies had been removed. Um, this is kind of what he said about just the process and, and how he felt. My, my thing in, in kind of piecing together the timeline, so you guys were they they wanted the the scene cleaned up relatively quickly. It sounds like then, it, it just seemed really quick when they when they let us in there. To me, you know, um, I mean it was uh, yeah pretty pretty quick. Um, I just couldn't believe that they were done like and wanted it like you said, kind of wanted it cleaned up quickly. I don't know. So. At that point, I had not yet seen the crime scene cleanup photos that Reggie would eventually show me. And now listening to this phone call and seeing those photos, it makes me a little bit concerned. Him talking about the fact that they felt like they were rushed into this job and, and that it happened just really quickly. And then now seeing these crime scene cleanup photos where it appears a lot of physical evidence or potential physical evidence was just thrown away in the dumpster. I mean, Reggie talks about how they were instructed to essentially throw away the desk, the blood covered desk that was right next to where the bodies were found. Paperwork drenched in blood all over the ground. The register, he thinks that they were actually told to just go ahead and toss the register as well. I mean, this is where money was supposedly taken from and he thinks that they just threw it away. I remember when you said clipboards and yes, I told yes. you that, yeah, there was clipboards? Yeah. That's because we were throwing the clipboards away. Wow. When you add all this stuff up and then you hear this call from months ago, this call seems more concerning now when him, you know, with him talking about how it felt rushed. So I don't know what happened. I'm not saying that they botched it from the beginning, but guys, that has been the rumor from the beginning of all this. So we have to question it. What happened? Did they properly process this crime scene? I know the composite sketch was released so like very quick, right? Do you know exactly how long it took? I know you weren't once again in that. I know it was very quick response that from the time the incident occurred to the sketch and the release of the Crime Stoppers tips. So it's not uncommon for information to be released in, in something like that quickly on a, a known suspect um, anybody with any information it's you know those are the ones you're looking for you're you're looking for that immediate information because sometimes as time goes by you you know you might dismiss something and it could be something that's huge okay so let's talk a little bit about this composite sketch let's talk about the witness 
that gave the description that led to the composite sketch that we all know. If you followed this case, you, you know what that composite sketch looks like. Somebody had to see this person. And the story is, the, the story that I've heard over and over and what we talk about in the documentary is that somebody was attempting to go into the bakery. I've heard m numerous different ages. I've heard that it was a nine-year-old. I've heard that it was a 14-year-old. I've heard that it was a 19-year-old. But a relatively young person was attempting to make a purchase at the bakery when somebody either coming out of the bakery bakery or somebody at the door already was acting like they were locking the door and said something to the effect of we're closed and the kid you know turned around and just probably thought okay that was an employee saying that they're closed I mean obviously an adult may question oh but I thought you are open until six or seven or eight or you know whenever the case was for that particular location but maybe this kid if it was a kid just thought, okay, I guess they're closed, and then went back to the car or, or whatever. That's the story I've heard from, from numerous people throughout this entire process. The one thing that's been interesting, the fact that I've never been able to figure out who this witness is, law enforcement probably wouldn't be thrilled <laughs> if it came out that this witness was nine years old, um, because I feel like they put a lot of stock in that composite sketch, at least releasing it so soon. Um, they must have thought, you know, and felt pretty confident about that, but maybe they feel otherwise now. But I didn't really ever come across who this was. I got really close a couple of times. Some people reached out to me and said, you know, that the witness's mom worked at this place and the dad worked at this place. And I, I called multiple businesses. I've tried to track down this witness and, and maybe it'll come out after the documentary or this podcast uh, and the witness will surface and I'll be able to figure out who this is. Obviously, I would have some questions personally for that witness, but the witness is the is the person that I never was able to come across. The only other person I could think of reaching out to that was connected to the bakery at that time was a man by the name of Rick Francis. Rick Francis, he was the manager for that place and I think he was some kind of a, I think they might have promoted him to some kind of a district manager or area manager. And Rick, you know, I've known him and his brother for years and years. Rick has always been shady. After he worked for Dolly Madison, he worked for the Love's Convenience Store and faked a robbery and, of course, got fired from there for that, too, but, but stealing money. I mean, robbery is one thing, murder is another thing, but, but uh, just kind of, uh, just like, but I think he was out of town during that whole deal because that's why they called me. But um, you may get a story from hell that you don't want to hear too from Rick because he's that kind of idiot. Should I exclude everything you said about Rick or do you give a shit? <laughs> I don't care. So another thing that came up around Rick Francis was that he managed a restaurant uh, around that time or shortly after the murders. And I think it was a Golden Corral. And somebody told me that it either burned down or somebody set fire to it. And it's rumored that he had something to do with it for, for an insurance claim. But once again, this is just something that was told to me and uh, obviously worth mentioning. But aside from all of that, Rick is somebody that is closely tied to this story by being a district manager of the bakery at the time of the homicide. So he was definitely somebody that I was going to reach out to regardless. So here is my phone call with Rick Francis. Rick, can I help you? Hi, Rick. My name's Aaron. I'm currently producing a, a documentary on the 2002 double homicide that took place in Great Bend, Kansas at the Dolly Madison Bakery. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not interested in participating in it, Aaron. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And I, I don't know how you're tracking me down. My wife says you called her, you friended her on Facebook and everything else. And that's just something in my past that I don't, I don't like even having to say I was a part of. And, Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not. Some days, all I know. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And, and yeah, I, I'm not necessarily saying that you're you're involved in it by any means. Or you know, I obviously we wanted to at least reach out to yeah, everyone. I, I was. I mean, involved in it. I was the district manager for 26 Dolly Madisons at the time that happened. Right. Uh, so, but you know, it's just past that point. You know, I, I really don't don't have much I could say it one way or the other. Just bad memories. Gotcha. And that, 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 it goes a little deeper than that. That's my hometown as well. And the, you know, and the lady, one of the ladies involved was a guy that I grew up with and played ball with all my life, that it was his mother. So it right. wasn't just professional, it was personal. And I, you know, like I said, I hope whatever you do helps him. I just, 
I just will decline to comment. And, and would appreciate that my name's not even used to say I decline to comment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, I, that, I, I can definitely do the, the service of not obviously hounding you about, you know, being interviewed, but obviously I, I have to be able to say I reached out to everybody, and if you decline to comment, I mean, that's something that I got to be able to say. Just, I decline to comment. Right, yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. Very fast. Hmm. Very fast to say no. I mean, it's, he was just like he said, a manager at that store, district manager of multiple stores. I mean, why, why not talk if you have nothing? I mean, it's just, this whole case is super shady that even like a district manager of the store, he should be able to say, oh, you know, this happened or that happened. Super baseline, broad. And he did tell me, he said it's a personal thing. Like that's what I'm after is the fact that this is a very personal story for so many people. Why can't he go on and say that? Nobody wants to talk about this. This next story is a wild one, and for the sake of this person who told me this, I am not going to be including their name, and I'm actually going to be altering part of the story in terms of their job to not reveal who this person is. Uh, but a little bit of backstory to how I came across this person. I was back in town actually for this press conference it's in September, and I had come across somebody who asked, you know, hey, what are you in town for? And I was like, well, I'm actually shooting a documentary. And he goes, oh, wow, that's crazy. You know, funny story. I was at the Dolly Madison Bakery the night of the murders. And I like stopped and looked at him. And I'm like, you, you're joking. And unfortunately, this person did not want to sit down for an actual interview for the project because this person is a very, this person's embedded in the community heavily and does not want to necessarily stir things up. But this story is too significant not to bring up. And though I would have loved to have had it in the documentary, it needs to be mentioned because if true, somebody needs to answer for it. Okay, so here's how the story goes. This person said, he and his wife were at Arby's the night of the murders. They said it was probably around 6.30 or after because that's typically when they would eat around that time. So he knows it was sometime after that. He said after that, they made a quick trip to Walmart, which is right next to the Arby's. Um, so it couldn't have been much longer after the 6.30, you know, them being done at Arby's. They went to Walmart. They said it was a very quick trip there. And then they decided at that point that they were going to stop by the Dolly Madison Bakery on the way home. According to him, they had never been there before, and obviously they knew that you could get, you know, snack food there. So they were going to get like a dessert, right? So they, they stopped by there, um, and they said that the door was locked. He said they went up to the door, it was locked, and he, they thought it was kind of strange, but they'd also never been there before, so they weren't sure of their hours entirely. I don't know if they were posted on the door, Either way, it's not like they knew for a fact it should be open because they'd never been there. But he said they peered through the, the glass. He put his hands up to the glass, looked in. They didn't see anybody in there, but he wasn't going to just sit, sit around. So they were about to leave. And they said around the corner came what he believed was the truck driver. This truck driver apparently said something along the lines of, I think the door's locked. I don't know what's going on. And so the truck driver's fidgeting with the garage door about to probably go in and discover the bodies is how I is how I take it. My, in my head, I feel like they found the truck driver, they intercepted the truck driver right before the truck driver discovered the bodies. And so they just go, okay, well, I guess it's closed or something because even the truck driver seemed confused as to why it was locked. So they get in their car and they leave and they don't think anything of it because A, like I said, they've never been to the bakery before and B, there's nothing really crazy about it being locked. I guess maybe they just thought, oh, maybe this person closed closed early or something. But the next day, the day after the homicides, this person is at work and somebody tells him, he overhears somebody saying, oh my gosh, two people were killed at the Dolly Madison Bakery last night. And he looks over and he goes, what? The, like the, the one here in town at 10th and Harrison? You're kidding. And, and they go, no, like two people, two people were killed sometime between 6.30 and 8 is what they think. And he just goes, what? That like in his head, he's thinking that is exactly when I was there. And of course, he's freaking out at this point. He goes home, talks to his wife, and they agree to call law enforcement, obviously, because here they are at the crime scene, touching the glass with their hands, looking in, you know, their DNA is on the door handle. 
and now they're hearing that two people were killed inside, of course you would call in because you would want to let them know that you were touching the door to their crime scene, but you'd also want to maybe see if they, uh, you know, want to speak to you at all about maybe something you saw in the area, if if something stood out as strange, maybe any of that. And so he calls in, right? So this is 26 hours. We'll call it a day later plus a couple hours, right? Maybe nine o'clock the next night. He calls in, letting them know he was at the door of their crime scene, touched it, was in the area, was in the area even prior because uh, they were right across the street at the Arby's just down the, down the road. So there's this is a key witness, a key, a significant person to speak with, right, that you would think law enforcement would be thrilled to speak with. And you'll never guess what they said to him. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're going to guess it because we're talking about it and I'm, I'm building up to this point. But they said no. They said, no, we're not interested in talking to you. If we go back to that press conference from September 6th, 2022, 7,307 days after the murders, they have the audacity to address the public and asking them to come forward with information even if they don't think it's significant. Yet, 26 hours after their homicide, they turned away somebody that was at the front door. The obvious question you'd want to ask somebody in that situation would be, you know, did you see anything that stood out as strange or maybe a person that seemed suspicious or or a car that sped away from the area? Like those are the kinds of things while it's fresh in the person's mind that you'd want to ask them. I mean, some people can't remember what they ate the day before. So you've got somebody calling in the next day. You want to ask them those things because two weeks later, three weeks later, that stuff may not be remembered by a witness like that. So them calling it in and being turned away is insane. I mean, in addition to that, establishing the timeline, that is so important early on in cases. And they could have helped establish the timeline. Being able to establish a timeline, being able to get that key information from people that were there is so important. And they apparently, allegedly, turned that away. Now we're going to hear a story from a guy who allegedly picked somebody up from the bakery the night of the murders. It was on a Wednesday night, Mm -hmm. and uh, I had a call from someone that wanted to ride to a Bible study, and uh, I was to pick him up there at that at the bread store there on the corner of of Tenth and and Harrison, and I went and picked him up, and he. He sat through the Bible study, and then I took him out to the edge of town and never heard from him again. There was probably about 15 or 16 people at that Bible study. They all uh, remembered that because he was kind of a seedy-looking fellow and had an army duffel bag with him, you know. I've been a pastor here, and, and I'm noted for the fact that I, the church that I pastored for a number of years, I I really didn't depend on it for income, so a great part of the, the income of the church went just to help people who were in trouble uh, in various ways, and many times people driving through town, they have a way of finding out about you, you know. So he didn't know you personally then? This man just called you no, uh, and said he wanted to go no, to some No, I didn't of... know who he was, and he didn't know me. He just he but, probably introduced himself at the at the Bible study, but you know he was just an itinerant. And I I had had and have kind of a reputation for taking care of the people that nobody else uh, wants to bother with, and he was one of those, I guess. He had a had everything he owned packed in that army duffel bag, and I drove a pickup truck at that time. I threw it in the back of the back of the pickup, took him out the edge of town, let him out, and left him out there going somewhere. And I told him, I said, well, if you're going to hitchhike, I'd go out to the edge of town. And I uh, guided him to a well-lighted place right. uh, where I thought he might have a chance to get a get a ride. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it you know it happened that very night that we picked him up out there. Do you remember if you ended up telling law enforcement about that incident? Since you had obviously you didn't think anything of it at the time, you were just picking him up. But then obviously, 
you later found out about these murders, I assume, and realized that you had picked this guy up. Was it substantial uh-huh. enough at the time? Did you end up telling anybody, or do you remember? Oh, yeah, I told I told a number of people. In fact, Bobby Peterson was the uh, secretary to the uh, chief of detectives at that time. Okay. I told her about it, and she talked to her, her, her boss about it, and... So I guess nothing came from it, you know. Yeah. So they didn't end up so questioning I, you at all personally, bringing, you know, having you come in or no? Anything? Well, really, I, you know, I had told them everything that I knew, just about like I did with you, you know. Right. Yeah. Because that, we never heard from him again, you know. He was he. I don't think he had any any local connections. Right. Yeah. He, he was just passing through. Just passing through. Yeah. He, in fact, spoke to law enforcement after this all took place, which it sounds like he did. He told somebody, I don't know what name he said there, but they didn't really need anything else from him. That's that's strange to me that they wouldn't want to follow up and get more information, especially since this guy sat in a Bible study with who knows how many other people. They could have asked questions about this guy's appearance. Just like the past story of the guy that was at the front door of the bakery when the murders took place and they touched the glass, you know, and they didn't want, allegedly law enforcement didn't want anything to do with their story. This is something similar, right? This is, a, it, it seems significant. It could just be a coincidence that he happened to pick this guy up. This guy could just been a guy passing through town, but he even just said it. They didn't really bring him in for any additional questioning, which is just bizarre to me. Very strange. Okay. Um... Well, that answered that. Okay, so if we go back 13 months from right now, the time I'm recording this segment, uh, to February of 2022, I was back in Great Bend shooting the very first interview for the project with Mandy's mother, Karen. And she told me this story that at the time, obviously, was was really interesting and, and super, super wild. But... I almost forgot about it since then because it never made it into the documentary. Every person I talked to since having that interview was never really able to add anything to that story to either validate it or or build kind of a sequence around it. And so, like I said, it never got you know added into the documentary. Um, but now, uh, since then, of course, I've put out the trailer. I've had the two local screenings back in Great Bend just a couple weeks ago. And I've had several people, several stories that have been told to me both both personally and people that have reached out to me online that are starting to make this story that Karen told me 13 months ago sound a little more plausible or at least like there's there's maybe some truth there. And so I'm going to go ahead and play the clip from the interview with Karen and then we're going to talk about what people have told me since the documentary has come out. The clerk, uh, after it happened, I went into the bakery and she said that day mandy had said to her if he comes in the store i'm going out the back door from what i gathered uh from karen uh, after the murder she had talked to one of the employees that had worked with mandy and this employee had told karen that mandy had been saying these things about somebody that was hanging around the bakery and she was concerned about it and that really was what was told to me by karen And like I said, it was interesting, but anytime I'd ask somebody about this, they weren't really able to add to it. But after the screenings in Great Bend just a couple weeks ago, somebody actually came up to me and told me a story about a guy that they know personally who was working at the Travelodge at the time, which are the hotel, the hotel right behind the bakery. And apparently he was in the bakery the day of the murders. This is the Facebook post that she ended up sending me after the screening Uh, to follow up with me. She said, Hey, Aaron, I talked to you Friday night about a gentleman that I know telling me he was in Dolly Madison the day of the murders. He said it was just him and Mandy, and she kept telling him, I need help. He said then a man came out of the back, looked him over, and he grabbed his bread and got out. He just thought Mandy was a new employee and didn't realize she was asking for help otherwise. He says the man had a baseball cap, but doesn't remember what he looked like. And then there's a second story, and this is the one that gave me chills. There's another person that wasn't there the day of the murders, but was there maybe a day or two before. And they are not able to confirm whether or not it was Mandy that was helping them. But it's safe to assume that it could have been Mandy because Mandy was on her third day on the job. She had just gotten this job. So 
it's likely that she probably was the one in the store at that time. And even if she wasn't, this story still is interesting. And this person basically says they can remember somebody peering through the glass, looking in and making faces at the worker that was working at the bakery. And they were making strange faces and then they left and they didn't think much of it at the time. But obviously now with these two stories and with what Karen said, I'm beginning to wonder, was there somebody hanging around outside the bakery, making weird faces through the glass, freaking Mandy out to the point where she was talking to her coworker saying, if he comes in here, I'm running out the back or I'm going out the back door or whatever she may have said. I don't know. It really makes you wonder about the story of the man who picked somebody up at the bakery or at least at that intersection and took him to a Bible study the night of the murders only to let him off on the edge of town where he hitchhiked out of Great Bend. Is there a connection there? When you start to think about and link some of these stories together, a possible guy hanging around the smoke shop for a few days, maybe a guy who was just passing through town. And then this guy picks somebody up from that area around the time of the murders who had a duffel bag and all of his stuff with him, who was adamant about leaving town. Like, is there a possibility that this was somebody hanging around the smoke shop at the time of all this? And did he just get out of town before anyone knew what had happened? Okay, so about 25 minutes ago, I was mentioning kind of the two people that I wish I would have been able to interview for this documentary, the two people that are kind of the biggest mysteries surrounding this case for me. And that, of course, is the witness that allegedly saw a man exiting the building with a set of keys, acting as if they were locking the door, saying something like, were closed, something to that effect. And then, of course, the truck driver who later that night was the one who apparently discovered the bodies in the office of the Dolly Madison Bakery. Up until a few days ago, both of those people had still remained a mystery. But just a few days ago, the wife of the truck driver who discovered the bodies reached out to me, and I was absolutely blown away. I was able to confirm through several sources online that she was in fact married to a man who worked for Interstate Brands and Dolly Madison for close to 30 years, so there's really no reason for me to not believe her story. And unfortunately, he has since passed. He passed away in late 2022, but she was still willing to have a phone call with me, only if I would exclude his name. So anytime you hear her mentioning his name, there will either be a sound that's made or I'll just mute it entirely. But here is my phone call with the wife of the driver who discovered the bodies at the Dolly Madison Bakery. He was on his way back from, I'm not sure if it was Colorado or Wyoming or wherever. So he was on his way back from his regular route when they sent him there. And they told him to go by Great Bend and pick up empty racks. And he was like, well, can't I just stop and pick some up in Salina? And they were like, no, we, you know, great bands called in and they've got, you know, quite a few there and they want them picked up. And he was like, okay, you know, because it was out of his way. He had delivered there in previous years, but it had been a while. He went there and there was a car in his way because, you know, they go in through the back. They don't use the front door because all the empty racks are stored in the back. He did say at one point while he was in his truck waiting, he noticed there was an elderly gentleman who pulled up to the store and went and tried the front door. Mm -hmm. He was going to go in and he, you know, the lights were all on and everything. So the guy was kind of looking around through the window, didn't see anybody. So he left and got back in his car and left. So he thought, well, you know, I haven't eaten. So he went to eat at, I guess, it, I think if I remember right, it was a Chinese restaurant Okay, that was right there. He called me and said, well, you know, there's a car in the way. I'm going to go get something to eat. And then, you know, hopefully by the time I get through eating, that car will have moved. He thought, you know, whoever it is, they'll be gone by the time you know, I get done. When he went back, they weren't, you know, gone. And so he called in to Dolly, and, which is interstate brands or hostess, whatever you want to call them. Right. And it said, you know, there's a car in the way. And they said, oh, come on, you know, you can load him in through the side door. So he put the ramp and, yeah, he was having to wheel the rack out to where he could park his truck. 
and was loading the empty racks from the back into his truck. When the customer came and said, hey, can you help me? We were supposed to pick up, I think it was like hot dog and hamburger buns or something for an event. And so he called back to Emporia and they, you know, said, yeah, go ahead and help the guy just, you know, write down what all he got because he had ordered them and stuff and, you know, just say that you helped him pick them up and he can go in and pay for them later when there's somebody around. Because they thought it was really odd that all the lights were on, but they couldn't find anybody. But the front door was locked, and I guess the door had been locked because the guy tried it a few times. Yeah, so his thought was, okay, this car is blocking the garage. I want to be as close as I can to the garage to load these racks up. I'm going to wait for this car to eventually move. Did he, did he say whether the garage right. door was already open or shut? or? No, no, okay. he never said. So, so he goes yeah, and eats and, and then comes back, and this customer is saying, you know, hey, can I get in and get this stuff that I was supposed to pick up? Right. Because he was loading racks out of the back when the guy approached him. And so, you know, he called into the plant and they said, you know, told him to go ahead and get what the guy needed and just leave him a note how many packages of what he got and the guy could go and pay for them later yeah. since he had already ordered them. And that's when they were in the store getting what the guy needed is when they found the body. They noticed the blood coming out from underneath one of the desks in the little office area. The other guy took off. He was like, nope, don't want anything to do with it. And then that's when, you know, grabbed his cell phone and called 911 and reported it because, you know, he hadn't seen anything up until that point because he you know hadn't been up there walking around looking because right he had no reason to he was there to do but, a different job and was just getting that job done and eventually was let in there just because of that that customer that happened to come by or else he may not have right. even he may not have even gone in and discovered them had that customer not been there no because if that yeah. car had been not you know parked there in his way he never would have you know gone in at all so your husband eventually yeah. came around the corner to discover the bodies in or he just saw the blood and called the cops and didn't end he up he saw the yeah he saw the blood and happened to look under the desk and he was like oh my god because evidently you know i don't know if they had been placed under the desk where they wouldn't be seen you know, I'm kind of confused on all that. I don't know for sure if he, but he couldn't see him from where he was. That's oh. why he kind of, you know, walked around the desk a little bit. They saw the blood and then he looked to see because he thought, well, maybe somebody was hurt. So in that little office but, area, he saw all the blood, but they, he couldn't even see the bodies from the door frame. No. So they were under the desk. No, not. Yeah, they he thought. You know, that was just my impression that whoever had killed him had kind of moved him out of the way so they wouldn't readily be seen. When um, we got there, there were cars everywhere and people, you know, in and out and in and out. And it even commented how many people had been, you know, into the crime scene. Yeah. Right. You know, anybody that went in there should have had on you know, gloves and booties and Tyvek suits and, you know, hair protection because of the DNA. You know, they questioned him and then they came back later while I was there and took him downtown and fingerprinted him and questioned him more. Mm -hmm. And I had brought clean clothes and everything so he could shower and, you know, put clothes on. And right. I gave them his shoes that he had on and his belt. I offered them his jeans and shirt he had on. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, no, we don't need those. And, gotcha. you know, like, okay. Then, of course, when KBI came a few weeks later to ask him some more questions, they said, well, do you still have those clothes? And I said, yes, but all of his work shirts 
and all of his genes all look the same, and they've already been washed. After I had told them that we, you know, offered them at the time, and the guys, the police department said no. Oh, they so, didn't want them. Okay, so that was a police officer that you would have offered them to, and they just, hmm. Well, that's not Yeah, that's and not they good. Had, no, it wasn't. And he just shook his head when he found out they didn't take his clothes when I'd offered him that night. Oh, wow. He was like, wow, I can't believe they didn't take him. They took his, his shoes and his belt, but they didn't want his clothes. They came, oh, it must have been last fall, I think it was. They contacted him wanting to get a new DNA sample. Uh-huh. And he swears that they had taken one way back when, but they, you know, said no, that they hadn't. And so, you know, he gave them a new DNA sample and they, you know, basically the only thing they said was they had developed some DNA, but they wouldn't tell him anything about it or anything. And huh. he was a person who overthought everything. And it was like, oh, my God, are they looking at me as a suspect? And I'm like, no, they're not. They're ruling you out. Yeah. So he's pretty con- confident that they didn't get his DNA at the beginning of all this, even? Well, when all of it happened, they, you know, questioned him at the scene, of course, and they told him, you know, that he needed to stick around because his truck, you know, it was in the considered part of the crime scene mm-hmm. because it was parked there. And so he couldn't leave. So they told him, well, go get a, you know, hotel room, which there was a place just down the street a little bit. And so he stayed the night and I had come over to, you know, give him moral support. Right. Yeah. And then they came back while we were there and then they took him down and fingerprinted him. And he thought that they had gotten his DNA at that time. But Brian Carroll said, no, we have no record that we ever got your DNA. It just seemed really odd that, you know, then 20 years later, they came back wanting all this information and his DNA. And I think things got, may have gotten lost. Somebody told him that they were having a memorial. So he and our son went over and attended that. When KBI, when Brian Carroll came and talked to him this fall, they questioned him why he went. And he said, because I wanted to pay my respects. Even though he had never met these people, yeah, didn't know anything about them, he felt like, you know, that was something that he should, you know, do to pay his respects. KBI, or when they did their little press conference, made it sound like, he was there all the time. It was his routine route. Well, no, it wasn't. Shortly before 8 p.m., the Great Bend Police Department received a call from a Dolly Madison Bakery truck driver who was doing a, a routine delivery, indicating that he had found two deceased females inside. That was not his routine route. They sent him there out of the blue. That is true. Yeah, the wording on that was that the driver was making a routine stop. Yeah, he was he was not happy. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, that he had to go and then to be involved in something like that afterwards really didn't make him happy. He's like, well, what if they're trying to frame me for this? And I said, they have to have evidence. Yeah. I said, there's no evidence that you were involved. I said, and the fact that, you know, you went there because your supervisor told you you had to. So they really had to go back and get the DNA from one of the main witnesses, the person who discovered the bodies. They didn't have that DNA in 2022. And they may not even have gotten it in the first place. Oh, my gosh. 
Okay, so I know there's a lot to unpack there, um, but I want to comment on a couple things. First of all, the fact that there was somebody with the driver when the bodies were discovered, a customer that was attempting to get into the bakery when it was locked, and he came across this driver unloading these empty crates, and they discovered the bodies together. I mean, that is an entirely new thing that I had never heard up until having this this phone conversation. And in addition to that, the fact that the KBI in 2022 was gathering the DNA of the person that discovered their bodies because they had no record of ever having collected it in the first place is unbelievable. I mean, even if they did collect the DNA in 2002 and they have lost it since then, that is just as embarrassing. And I don't know what's worse, but it reminds me of the questions that I had asked KBI in my initial kind of conversations with them. Obviously, I had some very baseline questions that I sent them and asked if they could answer. And one of those questions was, you know, given that this is a 20 year old case, do you still have all the original evidence gathered and available to you? And the KBI answered in their email to me and said, that the KBI and the Great Bend Police Department have retained all original evidence. And that answer was sent back to me in an email on July 1st, 2022. So either they're telling the truth and they have all of the original evidence gathered, and in that initial evidence, they never collected the DNA from the witness who discovered the bodies, or they're completely lying because they went back and got his DNA in the fall of 2022. So it would have been after probably them sending me this email. So like I said, I don't know what's worse. The fact that they maybe got it in 2002 and have since lost it and are lying about that, or they didn't get it in the first place. This is just, this is crazy. So during the production of the documentary, I of course was utilizing many different like subscription services to be able to access old newspaper articles from the early to mid 2000s after the homicides took place. And I was able to do that. I, I was able to pull a lot of great resources to use throughout the, the piece. I even went and subscribed to Great Ben's local kind of online service as well. And though they haven't been doing any digital archiving for a substantial amount of time. I think they've only been doing it for four or five years at this point. I came across something from July of 2020 that stood out to me. It was from July 20th of 2020, and it was an on the record that read, at 12.09 a.m. Monday, Great Bend Police Department was contacted in reference to the 2002 double homicide at the former Dolly Madison Bakery outlet store at 1004 Harrison Street. Obviously, after I read this, my brain exploded because I'm thinking this is, I mean, this is possibly substantial. Um, and though it didn't make it into the final documentary for a few different reasons, it's too big to not include in this, in this live stream and to talk about because it's substantial. I mean, you got somebody calling in 18 years after the murders, right? The murders happened in 2002. This is July of 2020. 18 years later, somebody calling in at just past midnight on a random day in July, calling in reference to the, the, the homicides. So, of course, in my records request, because I did several open records requests, it was CORA, so it's the Kansas Open Records Act that allows you to submit and ultimately obtain public records, I submitted for this particular document and this particular record. And the document that I later received, it was a daily incident log. This is the only thing that showed up in relation to that actual record request. And it has a redacted spot right here. Um, and obviously you can see that they were on the scene at 1214 and then clear time 12 16 so i don't know if they were on scene for two minutes or what that means exactly i'm not going to claim to know what any of this means but it's clearly in relation to that call that happened at 1209 a.m on july 20th and then i was looking in some of my records that i received for a different request and hidden kind of beneath and inside a, a massive pile of other records i came across this and it's a dispatch history, and I believe it's also related to the call that happened on July 20th, because the history shows the date, July 21st, 2020, and it's a follow-up, I believe, a follow-up phone call 
to the reporting person who made the call in July of 2020 that is the on the record. So I'm going to exclude the person's name from this document and of, of course their phone number, but this is what it says. It says reporting person advised that he has been waiting for two days for a detective to call him back. He has called the last few days. Reporting person advised he is getting ready to go talk to the subject that did a murder 20 years ago. Dolly Madison murder. Suspect is supposed to be calling him and stopping by. So, of course, I reached out to this guy uh, to see what this call was about. Why did he call them? What Did they ever follow up? What was the, what was the story behind this? So, here's that phone call. I'm excluding the names that he refers to. But here's the call. I guarantee you he knows. If he, if he didn't do it himself, he knows exactly who did it. Hmm. 100%. I kind of got the impression that he might have done it, but if he didn't do it, he damn, I, I guarantee you he knows who did it for sure. So he was talking about this guy and not really releasing or revealing this guy's name at first with me. And I wasn't trying to pry and, and tell ask him, you know, who are you talking about? Who are you talking about? Um, I just was wanting to talk to this guy and to also learn what the response was from law enforcement. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth in a second. But when I asked him, you know, what did you do? Like, did they end up calling you back? Like, clearly you made this call. You were saying that you were going to be speaking with the guy who did the murder. Like, you would think that they'd call back. And, and this is what he said. They never did. And that's what really threw me off. I was like... Yeah, that's so weird. They never followed up with you. If I called up the cops right now and said, hey, uh, that person that was rummaging through the trash, you know, behind some business or weather is such and such, I guarantee you they'd follow up on that. They'd be all on it. But it just floored me because I told them, you know, and they didn't, they didn't want to, they never followed up with me or nothing, you know what I mean? It just paints a picture to me that they don't, that they don't care because here you have somebody calling in and regardless of who it is, if they have anything to say about this, like you said, you would think they'd hop on the opportunity to try to like follow up and see what you have to say. So to me, it's just like yeah. they would rather it be forgotten and just not talked about. Exactly. Apparently this guy was possibly drunk is at least that's what this part of the document maybe alludes to. And if that's the case and they just thought, oh, this guy sounds hammered and they still didn't go talk to him, that's even more of a reason to be concerned because it shouldn't matter if somebody's calling in sober, drunk, or in a different language entirely. You should get somebody that understands who it is and and chases that down and makes sure that all the, all, you know, all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted. Uh, you run it up the ladder and you make sure that even if this guy sounds like he's bullshitting you, um, that there's not something important there. Oh, I guarantee you I was probably drinking when I was talking to him. But, but that wouldn't I be mean, any reason to write someone off. Exactly. You know what I mean? If anything, <laughs> people that are drinking I'm more likely to tell you what's going on when I'm drinking versus what I'm not drinking. And the who, whatever detectives that were on it back then is retired, so, you know... Most of them, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that well, and everything I've told you is like one hundred percent what I know, you know, from my perspective. So yeah. I mean, it's not like I'm trying to, you know, lead you down a rabbit hole one way. And, right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the reason you called this guy in, you said he said something that that kind of raised a red flag for you. Yeah, because I know exactly who did it, and then he was like, "I go what." He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I'll just tell you one thing. Snitches get stitches. And and I just kind of dropped it. So it must have, like, I, eaten up at you enough for you to call it in, right? Or, or at the very least, you thought about it later on and thought, oh, man, I should. Yeah, I mean, I'm friends with him. I worked with him. And then he left work. And he got back on drugs, you know. And when I was talking to him, and... You know, he got back into that lifestyle for a while when he told me that, and I was just like, okay. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't say anything for a while, but I was like, you know, I was like, if it is true, then they need to dig into it, you know. Bye. He called into the cops saying, I think I know who did it and I'm going to be talking to him soon. And apparently, this is just his word, they never properly followed up with him. I mean, that's that says a lot. Once again, if that's true, I'm, I'm once again in this weird in between of just speculation. Um, but that's all we that's all we have with this case is is these things to speculate on. Dang. Okay, so to finish off the story of the guy who called in in 2020 claiming to know who did the homicides, um, he ended up telling me the name of the guy who he thinks either did it or, you know, if he didn't do it, he knows who did it. And the name that he gave me was a name that had come up previously in this process. I had heard a story separately from somebody else who had told me that somebody after the murders came up to them and said, if anybody asks you, we were at the river. And when they said we, he was referring to this person. So I'm not going to obviously include his name, but it's a bit strange that obviously now this person thinks it's crazy that they were approached and told this. Uh, but just a day or two after they were, they were confused as to why this person was saying, you know, if anyone asks you this, we were here. Um, but obviously uh, later on, they thought it was very, very strange that that they had told them that i'm obviously not going to say this guy's name but uh yeah okay so i know i've excluded certain names in some of the previous stories that i've shared on this podcast but there's one person that i want to bring up that is out there somewhat publicly if you look into this case long enough you will see people talking about this guy on facebook pages and i believe he was a suspect that they were really looking into early on in this case and though i wasn't able to confirm it with law enforcement his name has come up several times, and that is the name Vincent Doherty. Here's just one Facebook post that I came across of somebody eight years ago saying that they believe he looks like the guy. And I think a lot of people would agree that he does look a lot like the composite sketch. But beyond that, I was never able to talk to somebody that really had a bigger story surrounding him, and so he never made it into the documentary. But since completing the documentary, somebody reached out to me who apparently lived with Vincent Doherty around the time of the murders, her mother was dating or married to him at this time, and this is what she had to say. When I turned him in the day after it happened, Detective Bailey from the Great Bend Police Department came out to my house. I straight up told him, it's Vince, and he's like, no, he has an alibi. I said, who's his alibi? He said, Art. I said, he lied for him all the time. He always has. I've seen it firsthand. When the police would come looking for him, he would climb up in a hole in the ceiling, and then his friend Art that was his thriller, would clock him in at work. I don't understand some of the reasoning behind things that happen in this town. If it wasn't him, fine, that's good and dandy, but they need to solve this case. I feel like they put certain energy in this town into other things and not enough energy in the other situations, if that makes sense. Yeah. He w did get on my Facebook once and threatened me, so I blocked him. I said exactly how I feel on Facebook, but I really don't care because he looks exactly like the person. I've seen him have violent outbursts. I don't care if you do share who I am. I'm not scared of him. I'm not like my mother. My mother lived every day for the rest of her life in fear of him. Okay, so I know we're... <laughs> This is long. There's a lot going on here. This is a long video, but this is for the people that really just want the exclusive behind the scenes of this project. But I can't go on without talking about the hotel theory a little bit more. We talked about it. We touched on it in the documentary. The rumors start flying. Do you remember them talking about the guy that was supposedly checked into the hotel next door? I know that they were looking at somebody that was checked in there. It was three months before Corey Latham revealed this to us. He called us and told us about this man. Okay, so by some chance, by some miracle, I was actually able to connect and speak with the manager that was working at the nearby hotel in 2002, where this entire theory kind of stems from. And I'm about to play that phone call in a second, but I just want to mention and remind people that the story that was out in the newspaper and that kind of had circulated around town was that somebody had checked into the nearby hotel, and when they checked in, he had long shoulder-length hair, and when they checked out, 
he had cut his hair or shaved his head. And that's kind of the main story, which in and of itself is very strange um, and obviously could just be some weird coincidence but it sounded always like it could have been connected and this story is going to absolutely blow your mind as it did mine but i want to mention also that the nearby hotel wasn't the travel lodge in my head every time i'd heard the story i always assumed that it was the closest hotel just to the east just based on proximity but it actually was the super eight hotel which is just about a block and a half to the west it's still very close to the bakery um, but that's where this person worked and this person's story kind of came from so i'm going to go ahead and play their story i'm excluding a few key details uh, about the story because as Mary Drake's family said, From what I remember, there were not one, but two people that checked into the hotel next door. And the front counter person is the one that remembers seeing a certain item of what would have been my grandma's with them. I don't know if it's been released or not, so I'm not going to say, but there was an item that, that they had possession of that was hers. The lady thought that the one person matched the description, and that's kind of the sum of what we heard. So yeah, they had mentioned there was a potential item that this person at the hotel had that could have been their grandmother's. For some reason or another, they thought that there was a possibility of that. And this person says something that absolutely made my jaw drop. So here is the conversation from the employee that was working at that hotel. So you were working there at that time? Yeah, I was the manager. The day that happened, I just happened to get called to the hotel because we had a water leak and they had the, the road shut down. So I had to park behind the hotel and walk across the road tracks to get to the hotel because they had Harrison Street shut down where the Dollar Madison store is. I was the one that checked him in. And I was there the next day when he checked out and seen that he had shaved his head, shaved his beard. When this guy checked in, he wouldn't speak. He wouldn't answer us. He wrote everything down in a little notebook. I thought it weird that he wouldn't talk to us. So he just wrote everything down like, I need a room or like, do you remember? Like he never spoke once? Not once. Not one word to us. We got that composite drawing, you know, the next morning because they delivered the newspapers first thing early in the morning. Uh -huh. When he was checking out the next morning, yeah. he made it a point to point at that drawing and point at himself and take out off his cap and show us that he had shaved it, that he was bald headed. He pointed at it and then pointed at himself, took out, off his bald cap, and that's where you could see that he had just shaved his head because it, all the tan, you could, it was white and he was tan all the way around. He did not have a vehicle. Yeah. And he had like a backpack and everything like that. So you know he didn't have a car because he just left on foot or how did you, how did he? Yeah, I watched him leave on foot and I told the police he was leaving. I told him what he was wearing, that he had the backpack and everything, that he was wearing a ball cap, that he was walking down 10th Street, but they still didn't come till a couple of days later, which the room had been rented again and cleaned twice by the time they came. You're pretty much 100% sure they didn't come that day? It's No, I know they didn't come that day. Oh, man, yeah. you had to probably imagine at that time that this could have been the guy, right? Or do you still even imagine that? Or do you think it was just a coincidence? Oh, yeah. Weird coincidence? I, no, I 100% always thought it was him. Do you remember what happened when law enforcement did come days later? What they did was they put a police officer outside the room he had rented, uh -huh. which was room 103. He was in the second room in from the door. And that was room 103. And they brought other police officers in to, like, dust for fingerprints and everything. Well, the room had been cleaned, rented, and cleaned again. So I don't know what good that had done. Well, I don't think Great Bend had ever had to deal with anything like that before. They should have called in help from somebody else immediately. 
Okay, so that is the story of the woman who was working at the nearby hotel the night of the murders. And one of the things that I didn't include from our conversation was this item that she had mentioned that this guy had with him when he checked in. She thought it was strange that he had this item and that was in her report to law enforcement. And it got me thinking about the item that Mary Drake's family had mentioned that this guy had possibly had with him when he checked into the hotel. And so when she had told me that he had this, I immediately messaged Mary Drake's granddaughter and asked her what the item was that he potentially had. And it was the exact same thing that this hotel employee told me that he had. So it's almost in my mind, a hundred percent fact that this guy, or at least somebody connected to the homicides stayed in the hotel the night of the murders. And it was possibly the guy seen leaving the bakery because he fit that description. He had the long hair. I mean, over the years when I had heard this theory and this rumor, it almost seemed too far fetched to be true, but it, it feels like it is. Okay. So the next story I'm going to include is somebody who reached out to me who was staying at the hotel right behind the bakery, the travel lodge, the night of the murders. Uh, who saw two people arguing in the parking lot behind the bakery. This is what he had to say. I was living at the travel lodge at the time of the murder, which was right across the parking lot. That night, I went to the office and was on the second floor when I noticed a white Ford pickup and a person, a male, talking to someone in the driver's seat. And it looked like they were having words, like they were fighting, but with words. I didn't think much of it at the time and went about my business. It seems like I've told a detective or somebody back then, but I have a feeling that somehow that it was related to what happened on the inside that night. I remember looking at the young man who did not see me. As I look back, it seems like he was the same or it looked like the same person in the drawing, but didn't have a hat on and a white t-shirt on. So once again, he's saying one of the gentlemen that was arguing looked like the guy in the composite, but didn't have the hat and instead of a black t-shirt, he had a white t-shirt. But this is interesting to me because it, it's starting to line up a little bit more with this potential of two people being involved in this. You've got one victim's family uh, saying that they've heard rumors of two people staying at the hotel. You've got this guy now saying that he was living at that hotel at the time and saw two people arguing that night and you know didn't think much of it. But then of course, later on, apparently he told law enforcement, were there two people involved? And I just have to say, going back to the crime scene photos, I believe in my head that there are two people involved in this crime. The only reason I say that is that the witness that allegedly saw the man locking the door and coming out of the bakery, had he been the one to murder these two people, after having seen the crime scene photos, this guy would have been covered in blood. He would have had, if he had shorts on, his legs would have been red. His socks would have been drenched in blood. I mean, they put up a fight and it was very obvious. There was an evident struggle in the center of the room that was so obvious. And I guarantee whoever it was that did that would not have walked out of there clean. Was the guy who was acting like he was locking the door, was he acting like that before he went in there? Or was there somebody outside the bakery acting like he was locking the door? Maybe, maybe a guy watching the door, like making sure no one went in after this guy. And then all of a sudden this kid is coming up trying to get in and he, oh, we're sorry, we're closed. You know, he kind of gets in front of the door ahead of him. I think that that is the case. I could be totally wrong, but we're all allowed to speculate here. And I believe there was somebody watching the door and somebody else inside committing the crime. And without going too into depth on what I think happened, I believe the crime may have started as a robbery situation or, a, or something else, but I don't believe that it was a targeted situation entirely. I'm not entirely sold on that is what I'm saying. Also, it was touched on earlier, but Mandy wasn't even supposed to be working that night. And she had only worked at the bakery for three days in the first place. So that's another reason why it doesn't feel like it could be a targeted situation unless somebody was absolutely stalking her because she wasn't even supposed to be there that night. The bakery has a bad history and and that's what we're going to get into now. We're going to get into the story of Dilton Myers, who worked at the bakery and why it revealed this part of the story revealed that the bakery's history isn't as innocent as the Dolly Madison brand. There was a guy, his name was Dilton Myers. His aunt had been a manager at the bakery in the 90s. Dilton ended up managing the bakery or assistant managing the bakery. He worked there somehow. And from what I've heard, 
he was teaching people like friends of his how to rob the bakery. Okay, so that was an excerpt from the documentary. And like I said, at the beginning of all this, if you haven't seen the doc yet, go down in the description of this video. All the ways you can watch it will be listed there. But Dilton Myers is another character that I want to dive into a little bit more because like with the 911 call, the, the on the record from July of 2020, there are certain things that I didn't really expand on in the documentary. And of course, I talk about Dilton and him teaching people how to rob the bakery while he was an employee there. I didn't go into what happened to Dilton Myers after all that after his time working at the bakery, and then ultimately after the murders, what happened with this character. And what I found might shock you. So let's just skip to the newspaper that is talking about the death of Dilton Myers. Okay, so this is from the Dayton Daily News, published on July 16th, 2012. It says, man killed by FBI was a registered sex offender. Dilton Myers changed his name after 1995 Kansas conviction says the man shot to death by an FBI agent June 28th had been a registered sex offender when he moved to Ohio in 2003. Fallacy Myers, 43, lived at 105 Samuel Street, where he was shot to death while agents were executing a search warrant. That warrant remains under seal. The FBI has declined to comment on the shooting, but Dayton Police Chief Richard Beale said June 28th that the investigation dealt with child exploitation and money laundering. Since the day of the shooting, Dayton police have declined comment on the shooting. Myers was known by his birth name, Dilton Richard Myers, when he was convicted of indecent solicitation of a child in 1995. That conviction was in Barton County, Kansas, and the offense involved a 15-year-old girl, according to records obtained by the Dayton Daily News. He was placed on probation, but that was revoked in 1997 after he was convicted of burglary. He was paroled in September of 2000, according to Kansas Department of Corrections records. Myers had been in prison on prior occasions and had burglary and theft convictions in the late 1980s. In 2000, Myers changed his name to Fallacy Mac Runes Myers, according to a court order filed in Leavenworth County, Kansas. The order states that the petitioner is a pagan and a priest within the religion known commonly as Wicca. It also states that Myers was convinced that he must rid himself of the burden of a judo Christian name. Myers lived briefly in West Monroe, Louisiana, where he registered with authorities in June and July of 2003. He registered with the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office from 2003 through February 2007, when his 10-year registration requirement expired, according to records. Fred Alverson, spokesperson for the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Ohio, said last month that when the agents arrived, Myers indicated that he wanted to cooperate with the investigation. The agents had been there several hours when Myers grabbed a knife and started stabbing himself, Alverson said. When the agents tried to use a taser on Myers, he lunged at one of them and was shot. While they were present, Myers lunged at one of them with a knife and the agent shot him. Beale said the agent fired three shots and investigators believe all three hit Myers. Myers' wife, Bonnie, could not be reached for comment. In November of 2010, Myers started ForsakenClans.com, LLC, according to the Ohio Secretary of State. The website says it is a free online vampire versus werewolf multiplayer game. A vendor license for the ForsakenClansman.com LLC was issued July 19, 2011, according to the Montgomery County Vendor License Database. The office was located at 2105 Needmore Road, Suite B, in Harrison Township, according to records. But the sign at the property was for Curvy Massage, which appeared to be closed after the shooting. Myers had a Curvy Massage sign on his car, which was parked near the house the day of the shooting. Okay, so I know that that article was a lot to get through. And to be honest, there's so much that we could just immediately dive into that was talked about in it. But let's just rewind for a second and remember that Dilton Myers was an employee at the bakery throughout the mid-90s. This is talked about in the documentary. And Dilton allegedly was teaching people close to him, friends of his, how to rob the place and, and get away with it while he was employed there. He was essentially telling people that they had to arrive at the bakery within a specific time frame. And, you know, it was right around shift change. You would send the worker to the back of the store to get a particular item that maybe wasn't on the shelves or to get 
a lot of a particular item, something to get them to go to the back of the store. And while they were in the back, you would essentially reach underneath the register. There was a slot where it looked like a drawer should go. And in that slot, there would be a bank bag there. And you could take it and you could either shove it in your pants and wait for the person to come back to the front and you could, you know, buy a $10 worth of something and then you'd leave. Or you'd just leave and chances are the person would come back to the front and you'd be long gone before they ever realized that the bank bag was missing. But that's what was told to somebody who is in the documentary. I mean, this is somebody who allegedly sat across from Dilton Myers as he's teaching her ex-husband these steps on how to rob the place. And so, and, and, and we actually later get police records and show that in the documentary as well that show that the bakery had been robbed numerous times throughout the mid nineties. And, and it lines up so perfectly with one of the stories in particular of when it was robbed around the time of the Oklahoma city bombings. This lady had mentioned that her ex-husband did this. He followed Dilton's steps robbed the bakery and I asked her you know when do you think this took place and she knew what apartment she was living at at the time and it stuck out that it was around the time of the Oklahoma City bombings and so one of the police records happened to be it showed that it happened to be robbed you know it was either three days before or three days after the Oklahoma City bombings so this is like you know I'm it's not guaranteed but it's uh it's likely that this is this is true and and just because this happened, I'm not saying Dilton Myers had anything to do with what ended up happening years later, five to six years later, when the homicides took place in 2002. But it's, you can't overlook it. This is a character that is tied to the story, whether we like it or not. And the fact that he went on to do what he did, it makes it such a crazy story. I mean, this guy, a year after the murders in 2003, he moves to Louisiana randomly, where he stayed for like not not very long at all, got into some trouble there, ended up in Ohio, started some vampire versus werewolves LLC video game, I don't know, forsakenclans.com LLC, changed his name to Fallacy Runes or something. Like, like what, like this is a, this is so strange. All of these things are so incredibly strange and they all happen to this one guy. And then He's got this massage parlor or curvy massage business. And then one day the FBI comes knocking on his door to interrogate him and he begins to stab himself. Like, who does that? This is crazy. The fact that this guy is connected to the city of Great Bend, let alone connected to the Dolly Madison Bakery uh, from being an employee there at, at one point. You can't overlook that, that it's a strange story. And to me, I'm thinking, you know, if he, and this is all speculation, but imagine he was someone that was robbing the bakery in the 90s, teaching people how to do it. And then one day in 2002, he's not working there anymore, but he knew that he could get a few hundred bucks by going in there during shift change. What if he's the one who went in there to do this and he moved shortly after, right? Moved after the crimes across the country to several locations, ended up in Ohio, and then years later has the FBI showing up at his door. I mean, it sounds like there's rumors that he had some like human trafficking charges potentially and weird money laundering stuff with this massage parlor. But imagine the FBI is showing up at your door. You have to have a lot going on in your life for the FBI to show up and talk to you. What if he thought, oh crap, like I bet they finally caught me for this Dolly Madison case, right? And then just decided to, to end everything there. So I, I don't know. I Like I said, do I think that that's the case? Probably not. But like this story is so crazy that my mind obviously went there because how could it not, right? So that's the story a little bit more in depth of, of Dilton Myers, or I guess we should say Fallacy Myers. So to go all the way back to what I was saying earlier about there potentially being two people, that's the reason I believe that is that what if somebody that had known that the bakery was an easy place to rob? What if that's what was going down? What if somebody went into the bakery because they had heard years prior from one of these people that had learned how to rob the place that it was an easy target? And what if they were in there, maybe strung out on drugs, and they knew that they could get maybe a couple hundred bucks easily off the bakery? And they did the exact plan that they had heard from others, you know, send somebody back to the back of the store. What if Mandy, being the new customer, or sorry, the new employee that she was, what if she was on her way back and maybe she turned back around to ask him a question and he was already reaching under the register, stealing the bank bag? 
what if that happened? And what if she was like, hey, what, you can't do that. You know, she may have reacted immediately like, what are you doing? And then panic ensues. He's now being caught red handed. She's fearing for her job because I've been told by family members of Mandy that she was so scared of just her own shadow even. And she would have been terrified and, and felt terrible for being even slightly responsible for somebody stealing from the bakery. And not that that would have been her fault, but I could see immediately something turning south if that were the case, I think the bakery was a place where maybe more was going on. And the records kind of reveal that it was being robbed over and over again. There were possibly people working there that were aware of it. Family members of Dilton Myers that were working there that may have turned a blind eye to it. And just, uh, there, there just may have been more going on there. That's just my thought. But uh, I don't know. Like I said earlier, there's not a whole lot of concrete, you know, big milestone moments that the public is aware of that came out around this case. One of which, though, is the security camera footage that happened in 2007. We talk about this in the documentary. We're going to go in a little bit more depth here. But this is where we get into kind of the negligence again, because obviously these crime scene photos, it's a big deal if they threw away all this physical evidence. It's also a big deal that they allegedly took five full years to look through footage that was next door, the business next door to the bakery, the smoke shop that shared a wall that still to this day shares a wall with where the bakery was once located. They allegedly waited five years to look through all of that footage. And then they find a guy who looks and matches the description of the suspect drawing to a T, the black shirt, the tall, you know, six foot figure right around there, the collarbone length hair, the shoulder length hair, literally wearing everything, a ball cap, everything that that witness said in that composite drawing, this guy is seen on camera the same day as the murders. He was next door and they didn't come out with that until 2007. Now, I will say they were tricky and they were sneaky with this. They tried to play it off like it was new technology that was able to enhance the footage for them. They used that as the lingo to make sure nobody would question why it came out five years later. We've had the surveillance video f uh, since early on. The problem we had with it is, uh, is really the quality of the video. But it came out five years later because they waited. And they told me that. KBI told me that it's embarrassing, but it is in fact because they waited to look through all the footage. The fact that they admitted to me that, th that it's because they just didn't look through all the footage. And they were confident that the guy that they ended up being able to identify, the guy that called himself in, he said, you don't have to look anymore. I'm the guy in your video footage. They went out and talked to him and they were confident that he was not their guy. But of course, I had to find that out for myself. And so in the documentary, you'll see that I, I made numerous efforts over the course of months to try to get in contact with this guy and finally was able to. His name uh, is Tim Moore. And uh, I was able to do a 45, have a 45 minute interview with him on the phone and, uh, and go watch the documentary to, to kind of see what he said. But either way, it's things like that that make me question this entire thing. And then when we look at these articles that came out five years later around the footage being released uh, for people to try to identify this guy, they say that the original videotape has been used many times and it's, you know, not good quality uh, and that they had to send it to a lab for enhancement. I mean, I'm not saying that they didn't still try to eventually enhance the video once they did come across it. But to use the enhancements and the technology as their reasoning as to why it took five years is just not true because like i said they told me also from the same article in 2007 the kbi is asking other local businesses in great bend that may have had security footage from 2002 to contact law enforcement because this guy may have also shown up in another video from another nearby business they waited five full years to ask the other businesses in the area for their footage it's 2023 and sometimes security footage automatically deletes itself after two weeks or a month. There's not a chance that any business from 2007 would have had access to that day in September of 2002. And the fact that the KBI 
publicly made a statement in the newspaper asking for this help. I'm surprised nobody called them out after reading this because it's ridiculous to think that they wouldn't have gotten this footage when it mattered most, right after the homicides took place. It's like once they finally looked through the smoke shop footage five years later, they realized, oh shit, we should have probably gotten footage from the other businesses nearby because this footage that we finally looked through has a guy in it looking just like our suspect. This is absolutely ridiculous. In the same article, uh, Dean Akings is talking about the last two transactions that occurred in the bakery. Uh, for a while, they were trying to identify the last two people that may have shopped there. And this coming out five years later in the same article about the footage being released uh, at least shows that five years later, they still hadn't been able to account for the final two transactions. When I talked to Heather Smith in 2022, she did say that they believe they were able to account for those last two transactions. So I'm not entirely sure, but at least based on this article coming out in 2007, uh, at that point, they still hadn't identified those last two transactions. Possibly two of them, two transactions that weren't, but um, I think I'm not 100% positive, but I do think that they were able to identify those individuals and she wasn't able to confirm it but she thinks now they were able to finally account for those last well two. i don't know the last two i really don't they must have came up with that later on then also i want to just give some respect to dean akings in this documentary dean akings now retired was the police chief in great bend kansas at the time that this took place more people turned me away than embraced the idea of talking about this case and dean was one of those people that was willing to talk about this case. And so I do wanted to say that I have an enormous amount of respect for him going out on a limb, somebody who's retired now, has been for years, he could have easily said, no, I don't wanna talk. And in the documentary, he fully say, says. And if it comes out that we made a mistake, then I'll own up that we made a mistake and let's clear the case. And so I think that says a lot about Dean. And even though nobody on the law enforcement side ne necessarily comes across the greatest in the documentary, just because of the sheer secrecy that this thing is, is wrapped around and wrapped in, I do want to say that I give uh, an immense amount of respect to Dean Akings for taking that interview and speaking with me. I also want to give a big shout out to Brian Bellendier, who is the current sheriff in Barton County. He gave me uh, over an hour of his time, sat down for an interview, and even though he wasn't sheriff at the time and only worked at the jail at the time, he still added so much to the doc, and I appreciate him for that, and he had some really nice things to say. As far as I know, and like I say, I'm not directly involved in this case, but as far as I know, the... I don't know that they're looking at anybody, that they really like anybody for in cop world, that you like them for this homicide. I just don't know that they, they've developed that. And in something like this, this would be a good time to turn to the media and to the press to, to help us out. The more eyeballs you can get on it, the, the greater the chance of it being cleared is. And I think what, what you're doing now is helpful because who knows what it's going to do or what it's going to shake out of the trees for us. Heather Smith, a current detective at the Grapevine Police Department, I give her respect for sitting down with me as well. And though Heather wasn't a detective the time this happened, she's now a detective and this is something that is on her plate. So I give her respect for that. That is really it on the law enforcement side and where I have to give credit. And look, I, I get it. Some people just don't want to talk about their work, especially, like I said, talk about a stain when they look back on their career and their history. And that's what this is. So I get that maybe people don't want to talk about this thing that never got solved, that they had something to do with but I did contact as many of the past detectives and law enforcement officers that I could have some of the big names one of which Terry Millard who initially was interested in talking he was quoted in his retirement saying that he wished that they had solved that before he retired and so I thought that would be a great interview to have and then out of nowhere Terry backed out and once again he can do whatever he wants. That is his decision, and I respect his decision, but it's just that's one of many that just decided to back out. There are a few other people that I reached out to as well that just flat out weren't interested in talking. So yeah, there was there was a number of people that were were not interested in, in talking. And once again, that's their decision. It's just it's just strange that nobody even wants to address or talk about this. And 
trust me, I tiptoed in, in reaching out to people as to not try to ruffle feathers. I came at it from a direction of, I'm just trying to help shed a light on this case. I'm not trying to make a piece that is controversial or points any blame in any direction uh, in terms of agencies and people involved. But I think the problem with nobody wanting to be involved is that ultimately it comes across that, that, that people are trying to hide something or they just like, why wouldn't they wanna be involved to some degree? And that goes to KBI. The Kansas Bureau of Investigation, the kind of highest led agency that is attached to this case at this point, because obviously it happened in Barton County. You've got the Grape and Police Department, you've got the Sheriff's Office, and you've got KBI, all these agencies coming together. KBI, to my knowledge at this point, are the ones that hold the key to the case. The current sheriff even told me he's never seen the entire case file. I have actually never seen the entire case. KBI is somebody that I obviously wanted to establish a relationship with from the beginning, and I did get to sit down with them a couple of times, but I always got a weird, I got a weird vibe from them as if they were kind of like thrown off that something was being made. They were kind of questioning. It just felt like they were questioning my intentions from the beginning. And once again, I, I wanted it to be very clear that I was just trying to get eyeballs on this, that if there was anything that they could include that could be valuable, to not hurt the case that could just be valuable to a new audience of people who've never heard of this case before, to think of those things. And I, I worded it like that. I said, what if this time next year, 100,000 people that have no idea about the Dolly Madison murders, what if 100,000 people know about this story? Is there anything you'd want to include? And I thought I was getting to them when I would talk to them in those ways, but there was still this reluctance, I feel like, for them to want to, to be involved. They should know that it's gonna look so much better to have an on-camera statement, even if it's broad, even if it's something that barely scratches the surface. But it was just frustrating. It was frustrating overall the way that they felt like I was just a, a gnat that was annoying them when all I was trying to do was was help the case and, and not you know spread rumors. Because all we have with this case, if you're from Great Bend, you know this, all we have is rumors. All we have is the speculation and the things that people have spread around town. And so I know some of those rumors and I didn't want to perpetuate or make those things snowball into something that they shouldn't be. And so I brought up certain rumors with them and they just couldn't clarify. The, the things that frustrated me with this is the person that I was talking to at KBI. His name is Corey Latham. Though he likely did at the beginning of all this let me know he wasn't the lead on the case, it's interesting that he never really let me talk to the lead on the case. He introduced me to the lead on the case one time, Brian Carroll, and all Brian Carroll did was ask me what I knew. He said like, what do you know? And I'm like, what, what do you mean, what do I know? I know probably 2% of what you know, and it's just the stuff that the public knows. I think he was just questioning who all I'd talked to and what I've gotten into at that point. I, I mean, I think it's just strange that they didn't see this as a bigger opportunity to just try to involve themselves in, in just a small way. I felt like I was being kind of kept from the lead in the case the entire time, because every time I'd go to KBI, I would just be talking primarily to, Bron uh, to, to Corey Latham. Uh, and that led to a text that I had, just questioning once again, because I couldn't remember who was the lead? I was like, are you the lead or is Brian the lead? And I sent him a text asking him that, and this is what he said. He says, uh, you know, Aaron, I've extended you way more courtesy than you deserve. I was lead from 2002 until 2010. The statement is from the KBI, and we are now done communicating with you. Be very blunt point. with you. Most of them, if you don't have KBI, FBI, CIA, FBA, don't have a series of letters behind your name, you ain't uh, that's, that's the way most of them treat everyone and that includes other law enforcement Corey's one everyone is you're not good enough for me to talk to i just felt a complete lack of care from kbi during this entire thing and it got me thinking about the families uh, in this case how they've felt this entire time i mean that is what i was told by not just members from one side of the family, but both. They've felt a lack of communication, a lack of, of want from law enforcement's end to get this thing resolved. They kind of made themselves look the way that they ended up looking in the dock by just not saying anything. So it's really, really unfortunate, and I have more that I could say, but I'll just, I'll leave it at that. I know for quite a few years, that case was in two or three big ring binders at David Bailey's office and that had the whole case
advice as far as pictures, and reports, interviews, all that. He had a copy of it all in his office. So obviously David Bailey was somebody that I was going to try to reach out to during this process and was able to get a hold of him on Facebook. And this was my initial message to him. If you want to pause it and read the whole thing, feel free. But essentially giving him the pitch, letting him know that I'd be willing to explain the project in better detail over a call or a text. His response uh, was this here. He was hesitant, but he was willing to discuss it further. Uh, which I responded, you know, I'd be happy to explain the project more in detail over the phone, which he responded uh, with his number. So that led to a phone call and ultimately him not being interested. Just like uh, just about everybody, he was not interested. And this was the case with pretty much any other name that came up during this process. I'm not necessarily going to show every single interaction I had, but this was the one that I had with David Bailey. Okay, so I don't know where I'm going to include this in the entire kind of podcast here, but I, I figured it's worth mentioning during the entire kind of scope of the production, um, especially after the 20th year anniversary um, new DNA evidence that we talked about, people reached out to me and I'm going to read one of these to give you an idea. This person messaged me right after the press conference on September 8th, 2022 and said, was the Great Bend Police Department honest with you? Did they tell you that their officers are the ones that ruined evidence at the crime scene? Did they tell you about Mike Ellis? That obviously was just one of many messages that was given to me that law enforcement screwed something up. I've heard from ex-law enforcement officers. I mean, the guy that I interviewed in the documentary said this. I've heard rumors, uh, they know who it is, but they mess stuff up and can't, you know, they, they need fresh evidence that they can't go back and get now. So I decided, let me count up the in-person interactions and the Facebook messages and just in general, how many times people told me that law enforcement screwed this entire case up. And it equals nine, nine people that reached out to me with basically that to say that law enforcement are the ones who screwed it up. So these aren't my words. These are just, this is just me um, saying that that happened. That happened nine separate times. There, and it's variations. Some of them aren't talking about Grape and Police. Some of them are saying KBI. So everyone's pointing fingers at everyone. And it's different versions of saying that they screwed it up. I've heard mostly things about the evidence and the collection of evidence. I've mostly heard that the evidence was botched from the beginning. And when I reached out to KBI uh, early on in the case, I asked them about the evidence. Do you still have all the original evidence in the case? And they said yes. But after seeing those crime scene photos, I'm wondering what evidence did they even take? Obviously rumors spread and it may not be true, but it's that started somewhere and it had to get through all those people and eventually people reached out to me. So whether there's truth to it or not, I don't know. So the Mike Ellis guy that she was referring to, I looked into him and supposedly there was a guy by the name of Mike Ellis who is now deceased, who moved, I believe, to Colorado. And at the time that this all took place, Mike Ellis was attempting to date Mandy. And apparently Mandy did not really want to date him, or at least that's what I've heard. I've also heard that there was a dispute that happened at the apartments that Mandy lived at at the time of the murders where somebody was arguing with her, and I don't know who it was. Was he her boyfriend at the time? There was allegedly a custody battle with the guy that she had a baby with who was in jail, but this Mike this Mike Ellis character, is the it's the first time I'd heard of him when this lady had messaged me, but I don't know really more to that, um, but apparently he died in Colorado. I think you told me even on the phone that, that you had even forgave who did this. I had, I had to Bef immediately. Speak to that a little bit. It I was. think that's a powerful piece. That it's, it's just, uh, there's a prayer, our father prayer. You do it because the Bible says to do it, you know, and you don't get to heaven with unforgiveness in your heart. And I knew if I didn't do it, Mandy wasn't even back for her funeral yet. I went out on my porch at two o'clock in the morning and I'm, all the stars, I've never seen that many stars. And it's like, and I got, I was screamed at God, I remember that. I was like, what do you want? I'm going to be burying my daughter tomorrow. And I was like, and I didn't hear anything back from the Lord. I just knew that I had to choose to forgive him. And that's what I did. Real simple. 
I choose to. Does that, that does not mean he shouldn't go to prison, but it does mean that I, I forgive him so I can walk. If, if I hadn't done that, it, all kinds of stuff comes out of unforgiveness. You know, that's a, a bad thing to have inside of you. So I wanted to include that little bit from Karen, Mandy's mom, and that was just one of the many things that she said that showed kind of what kind of person she is. I mean, she's gone through so much grief, um, not just with Mandy, but other children of hers that have died before her. And she actually ended up passing away three or four months after this interview. It's a bummer because she was really excited about this coming out. And I was really excited to make this and to, you know, have her see it someday. Um, So I'm sad, but I'm really glad that I got to sit down with her and hear her talk about Mandy. And and like I said, though some of the stuff didn't make the documentary, um, it's something that I'll still have. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm glad I got to meet her. Okay, so before I wrap this up, I want to mention kind of one more interesting thing uh, throughout this entire process. And that is the list of people that I have gathered throughout the last year uh, that kind of stood out to me, not necessarily a suspect list, but just a, a list of people that kind of stood out as suspicious, at least enough to where I felt the need to write their names down. And I just want to mention that my list has 19 individuals on it. Some of them are obviously the names that were naturally brought up through stories of people that, you know, they were possibly looked into early on or, you know, names from people that had reached out to me who they had their suspicions about them. But, you know, of the 19, there's probably the majority of them clearly probably have nothing to do with this, but it just makes me wonder if any of these names that were brought to me that I couldn't include if there is something there. And so, you know, at this point, law enforcement hasn't reached back out to me. They don't really seem to want to have anything to do with me or this project. And so I don't know if it's necessarily me giving them an open invitation to reaching out, but I obviously would not withhold any information if that relationship was to be um, brought back, I guess you could say, if there was ever even really a relationship to begin with. But uh, I am I am very willing to work with them and share this information or any of the information uh, throughout this process. Okay, guys, I, I know that this has been a long video. Thank you for listening to me ramble for however long this video has been going at this point. It's got to be well over an hour, probably closer to two. But I felt the need to put this all in one mega live stream video because I need to move on from this project. <laughs> I need to just get all of this stuff out there because I knew that I wanted everything possible for the internet to run with. For people like you who like to look into situations and crimes like this and unsolved cases like this, for you to look into some of these people, some of these names, some of these stories and and run with it. And I hope that that's what happens. I hope that people take this story and spread it and share it and, and hopefully it can reach the right person. Hopefully somebody that maybe heard something 20 years ago now, 20 plus years ago, maybe they know something and they don't realize they know something and they hear something about this case through either the documentary or this video, and they go, wait, somebody told me something kind of strange that used to live in that town, and now that I'm hearing this, it kind of, uh, it's kind of a red flag. You know, maybe something like that'll happen. That's my hope. I'm glad that I made this extra video to just kind of lay all of this out there and explain the process of this documentary. And there's still so much that I didn't include. Though I want to move on for the, from this project, I want this story out there on as large of a platform and scale as possible. So if there's anybody out there that wants to talk with me more about the project, don't hesitate to reach out. My information can be found in the about section on my YouTube page. I appreciate you guys watching. Like I said, thank you for getting through this entire video. If you haven't, like I said at the beginning, if you haven't already seen the documentary, it is linked down below all the ways in which you can watch it. And yeah, this will probably be the last time I talk about it for a while. Of course, if there's movement in the case, I will talk about it here on this YouTube channel. If there's ever a massive development in the case, if somebody's ever arrested, there's a chance for, for even more to be told around this story. But I don't know what'll happen. Uh, I have I had hope, but I don't know if I have hope anymore. Um, but we'll just have to see. So thanks for watching this. Maybe share it with somebody that uh, that would like to watch it. And, and that's about it. <laughs>